Woodworkers seek out Incra Precision Fence Systems for a variety of reasons. Some appreciate the built-in scale and never having to measure between the fence and cutter. It's hard to believe that just a few years ago, that was the accepted method to set your router fence position. Naturally, many are drawn to the joinery capabilities to add strength and beauty to their favorite projects. Others enjoy the versatility of a true router table fence system that handles all of the bread and butter cuts required by any wood shop, grooving and dadoing, rabbiting, edge forming, and even jointing. But all of our customers agree on one thing. INCRA's incrementally positioned fence systems make the impossible quite possible, allowing anyone with any skill level to precisely locate and later duplicate any cut. From intricate pattern work and exquisite boxes to large furniture projects, your LS positioner is up to the challenge. Before setting up and using your new LS positioner, let's take a few moments to become better acquainted with some of the control unit's basic operational elements. The LS positioner control unit is comprised of two pieces, the base and the longer carriage. The carriage includes the lead screw positioning element along with the micro adjust knob and the laser engraved scale bezel. The top of the carriage holds the stainless steel primary scale and includes four auxiliary scale slots. The magnetically held primary scale can be lifted and moved as necessary to accommodate your setups. The auxiliary scale slots are used to hold a secondary scale along with any of the INCRA joinery templates. You can add or remove any of these scales or templates as needed for your project and the friction fit holds the scale securely in place. At the forward end of the carriage, you'll find the steel fence mounting bracket for later attaching and securing your fence. The base anchors your LS positioner fence system to the router table and contains the hairline cursor and view windows along with the threaded segment that engages with and positions the carriage. With the carriage installed in the base, lower the three position cam clamp to unlock and slide the carriage to your next setting. Pull the clamp up to the center position when you want to micro adjust your fence position. Each audible click of the dial is equal to one one thousandth of an inch. The bezel tracks the movement visually and can be re-zeroed for your next adjustment. Pull the clamp up to the vertical position to lock the carriage securely in place. In order to access the full working range of your LS positioner's carriage, you first need to carefully position and attach the base to your router table. The leading edge of the base should be located 19 and 3 quarter inches from the center of the router plate for the 17 inch model or 27 and 3 quarter inches from the center for the 25 inch model. If you've purchased an INCRA ready router table, place a 2 inch hex bolt from hardware pack A21 in each of the four mounting holes nearest to your leading edge position and loosely attach the washers and hex nuts. Slide the base onto the fasteners to capture the hex heads in the T-slots on the underside of the base. Square the base to the router table and double check the measurement to the center of the mounting plate. Then tighten all four of the hex bolts. Now carefully slide the carriage back into the base and pull the carriage clamp up to lock the carriage in place. If your table won't permit the leading edge distances described, you can increase the size by adding an extension wing as we've done here. Just attach user-made wood supports to the underside of your existing table. You can use wood spacers or paper shims as needed to bring the two surfaces flush. Then screw the extension wing in place. To locate drill positions for the four base mounting holes, place a mark on your router table where the leading edge of the base will be. Now draw two lines parallel to the table, one inch, then three inches behind the leading edge mark. Transfer the center line of your router table to these two lines, then measure two and three quarter inches either side of the center line and mark the final hole positions. Drill a 5 16th inch diameter hole at each of the four positions, then mount the base as previously described. Now let's install the accessories. Slide the carriage to position the fence mounting bracket near the opening in your router table's mounting plate and clamp the carriage in place. 
Attach the Pro 2 fence to the steel fence mounting bracket using the quarter 20 by one half socket head fasteners with washers and rectangular nuts from Hardware Pack A7. Slide the rectangular nuts into the T-slot located on the rear of the fence. Position the fence with a notch centered over the opening in your router plate and tighten the mounting screws. After mounting, check the fence for square to your table. If adjustment is necessary, loosen the mounting screws and insert a paper shim between the fence and fence mounting bracket. A shim placed below the fasteners will increase the angle between the fence and table. A shim placed above the fasteners will decrease the angle. After adjustment, tighten the fasteners to secure the fence. You'll find the Pro 2 extender bar and stop handy for extending a stop beyond the end of the fence. To install the extender bar, insert the quarter 20 fastener with washer into the desired end of the fence, then loosely attach the rectangular nut. Now slide the extender bar in with the scale face up, leaving about an inch or so extended. Attach the stop arm to protrude beyond the front face of the fence and tighten the fastener. When not in use, the extender bar can be reversed and stored in the fence. The included shop stop positioner features the use of INCRA's patented sawtooth positioning racks and clamps to the fence at exact multiples of 1 32nd of an inch for instant and accurate repositioning. The stop's design permits conversion for use on either the in-feed or out-feed end of the fence. For the more common out-feed usage, assemble the stop with the micro-adjust screw on the out-feed end of the gold stop cap. The horizontal stop rod is designed for low fence applications only and can be removed or moved flush with the in-feed end of the stop. The long Phillips head screw should be installed with the hex nut on the in-feed end of the stop. Before tightening the long Phillips head screw, slide the vertical stop arm onto the hex nut. The lip on the stop arm should wrap around the outside face of the stop. The vertical stop arm can be raised or lowered as necessary to accommodate cutter clearance requirements or material thickness. It's the perfect accessory for controlling the length of a stopped groove and setup is easy. Just slide your material up to contact the cutting wing of the bit. Then clamp the shop stop as close as possible to the board end. Micro adjust the stop's position by loosening the two black thumb screws about one eighth turn, then turn the Phillips head screw to move the stop surface until it just touches your board. Tighten the two black thumb screws. Now, slide the scale to read zero under the end of the gold portion of the stop. Once the stop is zero to your cutter, setting your cut length is easy. Simply move the stop to align over the scale at the desired length and make your cut. Purchase a second stop positioner to make dual stop applications like the slot mortises we're cutting here perfectly repeatable. An easy and important technique to add to your shop capabilities. Great for decorating panels like this trivet project from the INCRA Projects and Techniques book. The INCRA right angle fixture is a joinery accessory that tracks the top of your fence to guide your workpiece safely and consistently for precise cutting results every time. Assemble the right angle fixture as described in the included instruction sheet. Then, lower the fixture onto the fence. Adjust the front and rear nylon thumb screws for smooth tracking along the fence, then tighten the locking nuts. When clamping material to your right angle fixture, always tighten the center thumb screw to lock the fixture to your fence. If your router table design permits, a spring clamp can be used to hold the fixture firmly to your table during the clamping process. Use a wooden hand screw to secure your material, making sure the stock is pressed downward and against the fence as you tighten the clamp. If you've purchased the LS Positioner Super System package, it includes the substantial capabilities of the Wonderfence Split Fence System. 
let's take a few minutes to review the features and operation of this important accessory. To attach the wonder fence, insert the supplied hex tool through the two large diameter access holes in each fence half and loosen the fasteners. For a better view of the fasteners, loosen the thumb screw and slide the black plastic view panel to the side. Slide the two rectangular nuts on each fence half into the T-slot located on the front of the Pro 2 fence. Center the fences over your router opening and tighten the two fasteners on each fence. Don't forget to close the two view panels and tighten each of the locking thumb screws. The in-feed and out-feed fences of the Wonder Fence can be moved independently in two directions to provide a variety of setup configurations. Gap adjustments allow use of large diameter cutters, while offset adjustments allow specialty cutting like shaping and jointing. Gap adjustments are made by simply loosening the two fasteners through the large access holes. After adjustment, always tighten the fasteners before making any cuts. Offset adjustments are made using the laser engraved wedge scales to gauge the offset. To initially calibrate the scales, loosen the two fasteners through the large access holes as well as the wedge lock fastener through the center hole on each fence half. Slide the black wedge on each fence to align the ends of the gold and black wedges. After this initial alignment, tighten all six fasteners. Test for fence alignment by sliding a reliable straight edge down the fence in both directions. If a slight offset still exists, fine tune the outfeed wedge only. Each tick mark on the wedge is equal to two thousandths of an inch in offset adjustment. Once the fences are aligned and all fasteners tighten, loosen the nylon screw and slide the scale pointer to read zero on each wedge unit. Don't currently own an edge jointer? The offset function of the Wonder Fence produces perfectly smooth, perfectly straight edges in moments. Here's how. After installing a half inch diameter or larger straight bit, move the LS positioner to cover the bit and lift the carriage clamp to the center position. Place a straight edge on the outfeed fence and micro adjust the positioner until both the cutter and fence contact the straight edge. Lock the LS in place. Now loosen the two fasteners through the large access holes on the infeed fence as well as the wedge lock fastener through the center hole. Slide the black wedge to adjust the infeed fence offset to about minus 20 thousandths and tighten all three fasteners. If you've never jointed with a router, give it a try. Even extremely rough edges can be smoothed up in two or three light passes. The router automatically holds the cutter perpendicular to the router table surface so you can count on an edge cut perfectly square to the face of your board. And with the higher RPMs of a router motor, you'll produce an edge smoother than any joiner. Whether you're looking for the often elusive invisible glue joint or the all-important straight reference edge for rip cuts made at the table saw, the Wonder Fence can get it straight the first time. Attach the high-rise fence cap as described in your owner's manual for additional support during vertical panel raising operations. For long-range fence positioning applications like grooving and data wing of large panels or joinery, the Wonder Fence and High Rise Fence Cap can be easily removed and stored for future edge forming or jointing requirements. Joinery may be the icing on the cake, but common router cuts like edge forming, rabbiting, and grooving are the real bread and butter of any woodworking shop. Here are a few simple tips to set up your LS positioner for each of these types of cuts. For grooving and datoing, you'll want to first zero the fence to the inside edge of the cutter. After installing the router bit, unclamp and slide the fence up to the cutter. Pull the clamp up to the center position. As you rotate the micro adjust knob, sight down the fence until the gap of light between the fence and cutter disappears. Pull the clamp up to the fully locked position, then slide the primary scale to read zero under the hairline cursor. 
With this setup, the scale setting is equal to the distance between the fence and cutter. So if we move to one inch, for example, there is a one inch gap between the fence and cutter. This setup makes precise groove location an easy task for your next project. For rabbiting, you'll find zeroing to the opposite side of the cutter a better choice. Unclamp and slide the fence forward to cover the bit. Then pull the clamp up to the micro adjust position. Now hold a straight edge against the fence as you turn the micro adjust knob. When you see the gap disappear between the straight edge and the fence, pull the clamp up to the locked position. Now slide the stainless steel primary scale to read zero under the hairline cursor. This setup gives a scale reading equal to your rabbit width. When you move the fence to half inch, for example, your rabbit will be a half inch wide. The Wonder Fence Split Fence is the perfect accessory to add for edge forming, accommodating both the larger diameter cutters and the need for dust collection. Chamfers, roundovers, and Roman OGs are just a few of the many edge forming cutters available. With these bits, you'll want to set the zero position at the location for your final cut, which is often in line with the cutter's bearing. Just move the fence forward to cover the cutter and pull the clamp to the micro adjust position. Now hold a straight edge against the bearing as you micro adjust until both the fence and the bearing contact the straight edge. Pull the clamp up to the locked position and slide the stainless steel scale to read zero under the cursor. You can now move the fence to a negative setting and approach your final cut position in several light side by side passes. These smaller bites ensure a smooth, splinter-free results. There are many things you'll do with an LS positioner at your router table. Grooving and dadoing, rabbiting, and edge forming, to name a few. But there is nothing quite so satisfying as a perfectly cut box joint or dovetail using your INCRA precision fence system. With just a little preparation and a few quick setups, joints like these are surprisingly easy. Let's take a look. Before beginning your first joinery project, make sure your stock is flat, smooth, and square cut. No dovetail or box joint jig today can produce quality work from stock like this. When selecting your stock width for a joinery project, a good rule of thumb is to allow enough width for at least a half pin at both edges of the stock. To determine the width, just use the full scale diagrams at the back of the master reference guide. These one-to-one -one scale drawings are a great visual reference for all of the joinery patterns. The cross hatched area represents solid wood. Just measure from the approximate center of any one of the cross hatched pins to the approximate center of another. To make your project narrower or wider, just step over to the next pin. As for material thickness, the suggested stock thickness under each diagram is a good starting point. If you must vary the stock thickness because of your project requirements, just keep these important guidelines in mind. For box joints, when cutting material thicker than the diameter of your cutter, you should first make a shallow series of cuts, then increase the depth and repeat. Never cut deeper than the diameter of the cutter in a single pass. For half blind, corner post, and double dovetails, always use material that is greater in thickness than the router bit's depth of cut. For through dovetails, keep in mind that for a given cutter, there is one and only one depth of cut that will provide a good fit. Once you've established the depth of cut, as described in the next chapter, Thickness plane your stock down to match the depth of cut. Never raise the cutter up to match your stock thickness. To set your depth of cut for box joints, simply raise the cutter to match your stock thickness. For dovetail joints, depth of cut is used to control the fit of your joint. Too low and the fit is too loose. Too high and the fit is too tight. But follow along and you'll learn how to set it just right. Install the dovetail bit required for your pattern selection and set the initial depth of cut to the value shown under the diagram. Also, take note of the spacing to set depth of cut dimensions shown. 
At your router table, slide the fence to cover about half of the dovetail bit and lock the carriage clamp. Then slide the Lexan scale to read zero under the hairline cursor. We'll use this scale to gauge the distance between the two test cuts. Clamp two pieces of square cut scrap stock to the right angle fixture and make the first cut. Unclamp and slide the carriage to align at 7 eighths and make a second cut. Remember, 7 eighths of an inch was shown as the spacing to set depth of cut for our pattern. Unclamp the two boards and test the fit. If you pull the two dovetails one against the other, the gap that forms is equal to the amount you need to raise the cutter to tighten the joint. If the boards are too tight or won't fit at all, you need to lower the bit to loosen the joint. Just remember, heighten to tighten, lower to loosen. In either case, adjust your depth of cut accordingly, then repeat the test cuts on a fresh corner of the boards. In general, it's best to set the initial depth of cut for the first set of trial cuts a little shallow. That way, your first test cut will show how much to raise the cutter. When the first set of cuts are too tight, they indicate that the cutter must be lowered, but don't reveal how much to lower it. After completing the second series of cuts, test the fit again. Now there's a good fitting dovetail. After setting your router bit's depth of cut, you need to locate the fence and position the selected joinery template so that all of the cuts happen in the right places on your stock. This is accomplished through a setup process called centering. Whether setting up for box joints or dovetails, the simple steps to follow should always be used. Begin by sliding your selected template into one of the available scale slots in the LS positioner's carriage. Don't worry about final positioning just yet. When preparing the stock for your box, also cut a 6 inch long piece of 3 quarter inch stock to the exact same width. We'll use this piece as our centering board. Mark the center of one end of the centering board. Now visually align the mark with the approximate center of the cutter. Slide the fence up to the edge of the board and then lock the carriage in place. Turn your router on and using a good rubber sole push block, cut a groove along the entire length of the board. Turn the stock end for end and repeat the cut. If you widen the groove on the second pass as we did here, you're slightly off center. Just one final step, however, will bring the cutter to the exact center of the board. Turn off your router. With the cutter at its widest profile, slide the centering board up to the bit. Holding the board against the fence, unclamp and move the fence to visually center the cutter within the groove. You can fine tune the position using the micro adjuster. When you see an equal gap on both sides of the cutter, lock the carriage clamp in place. Now slide the joinery template to align the suggested center cut directly under the hairline cursor. You'll find the selected center cut for your template listed under the diagram of your chosen pattern in the Master Reference Guide. It's okay if some portion of the template overhangs the rear of the carriage. However, you can slide the template further into the carriage and simply choose a new center cut. On an equally spaced template, any mark can be used. For information on choosing an alternate center cut for variably spaced patterns, see page 4 of the Master Reference Guide. In the three joinery techniques to follow, half-blind dovetails, 
corner post dovetails, and through dovetails. All of the examples shown reflect stock preparation and centering based on two and three quarter inch wide material using the Dove J pattern. If you set your depth of cut for a half inch 14 degree dovetail bit, center your LS for two and three quarter inch wide material using 7B on the template for your center cut. Then prepare your stock accordingly for each joint type. You'll be able to duplicate the example shown cut for cut, a good way to warm up to the new techniques shown. Begin by watching the half blind dovetail section, since many of the tips and techniques shown and fully described in that chapter may be mentioned only briefly in the other dovetail chapters. Now, let's cut some dovetails. After centering, set the LS fence to a position where the router bit is only exposed a 32nd of an inch or less. You can test this with your centering board. This position is referred to as the scoring pass. Lock the carriage and slide the Lexan measuring scale to read zero under the hairline cursor. We'll start the tail boards beginning with a dovetail shaped rabbit cut made across each end of both boards. The scoring pass will shear the fibers of the wood to start the rabbit without tear out or splintering and is a good technique for any rabbit or edge cutting operation. The full rabbit width needs to be about 7 30 seconds of an inch wide for the Dove J template we're using here, but rather than making this cut in a single pass, we'll take out the material with three subsequent cuts, moving the fence back 1 16th of an inch for each pass. While this does add a little time to the rabbit cut, it yields a smoother cut result. You'll find the rabbit width listed under the diagram of your selected pattern in the Master Reference Guide. Apply light downward pressure to keep the tailboard on the table and use your rubber sole push block to move the piece through the cut. Now we'll make the through cuts to produce the tails. Add your right angle fixture to the end of the fence and tighten the thumb screw to secure it. If your router table permits, clamp the fixture to your table edge with a spring clamp. Place the two pieces with rabbits facing away from each other on the faceplate of the right angle fixture. Push the boards down and against the fence, then secure with a wooden hand screw clamp. Remove the spring clamp. Return your fence to the scoring pass position at zero. The first cut for any tailboard will always remove the edge of the stock. To keep this first cut clean and splinter free, you should always begin with a scoring pass, then sneak up to the first template mark in front of the zero in one or two passes. Once you've reached the first mark, 5A in this example, and made the cut, simply move the LS positioner from A cut to A cut until you've cut across the full width of the material. Keep in mind that your first tail cut will be based on the width of stock you have centered on. It probably won't be 5A, and it may in fact be a B cut. After completing the cuts, clamp your right angle fixture to both fence and table, flip the stock, and reclamp to the fixture with your wooden hand screw clamp. Now return the fence to a scoring pass and repeat the tail series of cuts. Since your LS positioner is set up with respect to the center of your stock, you don't need to worry about which edge of the tailboards are against the fence when flipping the stock on the right angle fixture. Again, after you sneak up to the first A cut, move the LS from A cut to A cut until you've cut across the width of your stock. This completes the tailboards.
For the pin cuts, move the fence to the first mark of the template which positions the bit outside the fence, 6B in this example. Since the pin sockets are stopped cuts, bring the stop positioner just up to the outside diameter of the cutter and clamp in place. The vertical stop arm on the shop stop should be above the cutter but slightly below the thickness of your pin board. This stop setup will always produce a socket that is a little short, so we'll only cut one end of one piece at this time, then adjust as necessary. Move the stock into the cut until you just touch the stop arm. Don't force the material against the stop. Now move from B cut to B cut until you've cut across the full width of the material. Assemble the pin board to one of the tail boards to determine how much you need to adjust the cut length. The amount that the tails protrude is exactly how much the stop needs to be moved away from the cutter to achieve a flush fit. Use the scale on top of the fence as a reference and move the stop away to lengthen the cut. Return the fence to the first pin cut and repeat the cuts for both ends of both pieces. When using the rubber sole push block, position the push block about a quarter inch or so behind the forward end of the board. This keeps the pressure in the important area of the cut. Also, keep the push block about a quarter inch or so away from the fence. This allows you to see that your wood is against the fence at all times. Always blow the table off between cuts, since a tiny chip between the board and the fence can easily change your cut location, while a chip underneath will raise the board, changing your depth of cut. Assemble both pin boards to one of the tails. Then add the other tail board and drive the tails home. There, a perfect half blind dovetail. For this decorative joint, you'll need the same four pieces required for any half-blind joint, plus a piece of contrasting color stock about eight inches long to make the corner post. All should be the same thickness and width. After centering and installing your selected dovetail template, set the fence to a scoring pass position and lock the carriage. Slide the Lexan measuring scale to read zero under the cursor. Clamp the right angle fixture to your fence and table, then clamp your two long pieces with a backing board to the faceplate using a wooden handscrew clamp. You can use your centering board as the backing board. Remove the spring clamp. After making a scoring pass cut, advance to the first template mark in front of the zero in one or two passes. Once you've reached the first mark, 5A in this example, and made the cut, we'll simply move the fence from one A cut to the next until we've cut across the full width of the material. Keep in mind that your first cut mark will be based on the width of stock that you've centered on. If you've centered on a two and three quarter inch wide material as we have using the Dove J template with 7B as your center cut, your cut locations will be the same as ours. After completing the cuts, slide the right angle fixture to the end of the fence, clamp it down, and flip the stock.
always make sure that the stock is securely down on the table and against the fence before clamping. Remove the spring clamp. Return the fence to a scoring pass position and beginning with this cut, repeat the A series of cuts on these pieces. Always use a smooth feed progression, pushing forward smoothly and pulling back smoothly. To make the corner posts, set the LS to the first B mark on the template that exposes the cutter in front of the fence and lock the carriage. Using a rubber sole push block, cut a groove along the entire length of the corner post material. Now move the fence from one B cut to the next to cut the grooves across the full width of the corner post material. At your table saw, we'll use a miter gauge with a wooden subfence to cross cut the corner post stock. Place a cutoff from your box material against the blade and mark the subfence as shown. Advance the corner post stock about 1 16th of an inch past the mark on the subfence and cross cut four pieces. Now we can glue the corner post pieces to the two A boards cut earlier. Use a brush to apply glue to two of the corner post pieces. Then apply glue to both ends of the mating box side. Slide the corner post pieces onto each end of the box side and center so that the corner post overhangs each face of the larger piece slightly. We'll sand them flush later. Place scrap wood clamping calls at each end and clamp. Wipe off excess glue squeeze out with a damp cloth and set aside. Then repeat the glue up procedure for the remaining pieces and set aside to dry for about 30 minutes.
At your sander, sand the corner posts flush with the face of the larger pieces. Reverse the piece direction to avoid over sanding one end. After sanding both faces of both pieces, turn off the sander and then use the stationary belt to remove any squeeze out or overhang of the corner post along the edges of the material. To be clear, we are sanding the dark corner post pieces flush with the edges of the lighter piece, not the other way around. You do not want to change the width of the larger pieces. From this point forward, all we're doing is using standard half-blind dovetail technique to join the four rectangles of wood. To cut the tailboards, we'll begin with the dovetail-shaped rabbits. Move the LS to a scoring pass position and lock the carriage in place. The full rabbit width for the Dove J pattern we've selected needs to be 7 30 seconds of an inch wide. But rather than making the cut in a single pass, again, cut the rabbits with several light side-by-side -side passes, moving the fence back 1 16th of an inch for each cut. Now it's time for the through cuts. Clamp the right angle fixture to your fence and table and place the two tailboards with the rabbits facing away from one another against the faceplate. Press the boards securely against the fence and table, then clamp with your wooden handscrew clamp. Return the fence to a scoring pass position and make the cut. Now advance to the first template mark in front of your zero position in one or two passes. Once you've reached the first mark, 5A in this example, and made the cut, simply move the LS from A cut to A cut until you've cut across the full width of the material. After completing the cuts, immobilize the right angle fixture by clamping to the fence and to your table, then flip the stock. Return the LS to a scoring pass and repeat the final tail series of cuts on your two boards.
This completes the tail cuts. Now for the pin boards. The pin cuts are made with the stock face down on the router table. Move the LS to the first pin cut that positions the cutter outside the fence, 6B in this example. Since the pin sockets are stopped cuts, bring the shop stop just up to the outside diameter of the cutter and clamp in place. This stop setup will always produce a socket that is a little short, so we'll only cut one end of one piece at this time, then adjust as necessary. Move the stock into the cut until you just touch the stop. Don't force the material against the stop. Now move from B cut to B cut until you've cut across the full width of your material. Assemble the pin board to one of the tail boards to determine how much you need to adjust the cut length. The amount that the tails protrude is exactly how much you need to move the stop away from its current position. Slide the fence scale to an easy reference, then move the stop away from the cutter an amount equal to how much the tails protrude from the pin sockets. Return the fence to the first pin cut and repeat the cuts for both ends of both pieces. Advance slowly into each cut to avoid tear out on the corner post. And as always, blow off the table between cuts, since a tiny chip between the board and fence or table can easily change your cut location or alter the fit. Assemble both pin boards to one of the tails. Then add the other tail board and drive the tails home. Try this beautiful joint on your next jewelry box project. When preparing stock for through dovetails, keep in mind that for a given cutter and joinery template, there is one and only one depth of cut that will provide a good fit. Once you've established the depth of cut for your template, thickness plane your stock down to match the depth of cut. Never raise the cutter up to match your stock thickness. We'll begin with the tail cuts. After centering and installing the template, set the fence to a scoring pass position, then clamp the carriage and slide your scale to read zero under the hairline cursor. Clamp the right angle fixture to the fence and table, then clamp the two shorter pieces of stock with a backing board to the faceplate. You can use your centering board as the backing board. Securely tighten the wooden hand screw clamp, then remove the spring clamp. Make a scoring pass cut, then advance to the first template mark in front of the zero position in one or two passes. Once you've reached the first mark, 5A in this example, move the fence from one A cut to the next until you have cut across the full width of your stock.
After completing the cuts, immobilize the right angle fixture by clamping to both the fence and the table and flip the stock over. Make sure the stock is pressed securely to the table and against the fence before clamping in place. Return the fence to a scoring pass location, then repeat the cuts on the tailboards. After completing the tail cuts, return the right angle fixture to the end of the fence and clamp in place. Remove the tails, flip the backing board over and add the two pin boards. Tighten the hand screw clamp, then remove the spring clamp. Move the LS to the first B-cut location, which places the bit just outside the fence, 6B in this example, and make the cut. Now, move the fence from one B-cut to the next to complete the cuts across the full width of the pin boards. After completing the cuts on this end of your two pin boards, return the right angle fixture to the end of the fence and clamp to the fence and table. Allow the cutter to come to a complete stop before unclamping your two pieces. Now flip the stock and reclamp. Repeat the pin series of cuts across the full width of the boards. We'll now repeat the pin series of cuts, this time with the material face down on the table. Return your LS to the first pin cut on the template. With the router off, slide one of your pin boards to nest the cutter just inside the existing cut. We need to stop the cut just before the cutter contacts the end of the existing cut. Assemble the shop stop extender to the vertical stop arm as described in the instruction sheet included with the stop. Now, clamp the stop to your fence with the extender as close as possible to the end of the board. Loosen the black thumb screws one eighth turn and then turn the micro adjust screw until the stop just touches the end of the board. After adjustment, be sure to always tighten the two black thumb screws. Move the board away from the cutter, turn the router on, and using a good rubber sole push block, make the cut at both ends of both boards. Move the stock into the cut until you just touch the extender. Don't force the material against the stock. Keep the same face down on both boards throughout the entire series of cuts. Move your LS from one B cut to another to complete the cuts on each of your two pin boards.
If you try to assemble your pin and tail pieces at this point, you would find that a small triangle of wood blocks the two pieces from sliding together. To complete the joint, all you need to do is whittle off this triangle of wood. This can be accomplished with a pocket knife, a razor knife, or a chisel as shown. Just follow the line of cut that was started straight back into the corner. Now you can assemble your pin and tail pieces for a perfect through dovetail. For this decorative joint, we're using the IDDD template with 6C e as our center cut and 2 and 5 8 inch stock. You'll need four pieces for the box sides and one piece of three quarter inch contrasting color stock about eight inches long to make the decorative trim section. Set the fence to a scoring pass position and slide the Lexan measuring scale to read zero under the cursor. Mark one edge of the two shorter pieces of stock and clamp them with a backing board to the faceplate of your right angle fixture. The marked edge should always be placed against the fence when cutting these two pieces. You can use your centering board as the backing board. Tighten the wooden hand screw clamp securely. Beginning with a scoring pass, advance to the first A cut on the template, 8A in this case, in one or two passes. Now advance from one A cut to another across the width of your material. Clamp the right angle fixture to your fence and table and flip the boards over. Remember, pencil edge to the fence. Press the boards downward and against the fence as you securely tighten the wooden hand screw clamp. Return the LS to a scoring pass position and repeat the A series of cuts across the width of your stock.
To produce the trim section stock, set the LS to the first B cut that exposes the cutter in front of the fence, 5B in this case, and lock the carriage. Using a rubber sole push block, cut a groove along the entire length of the trim section material. Now move the LS from one B cut to the next to cut the grooves across the full width of your material. At your table saw, we'll use a miter gauge with a wooden subfence to cross cut the trim section stock. Place a cutoff from your box material against the blade and mark the subfence as shown. Advance the trim section stock about a sixteenth of an inch past the mark on the subfence and cross cut four pieces. Now, we'll glue the trim section pieces to the A-cut pieces cut earlier. Use a brush to apply glue to two of the trim section pieces. Then, apply glue to both ends of one of the mating A-cut pieces. Slide the trim section pieces onto each end of the mating piece and center so that the trim section overhangs each face of the larger piece slightly. We'll sand them flush later. Clamp the pieces together, then wipe off excess glue squeeze out and set aside. Repeat the glue up procedure for the remaining pieces and set aside to dry for about 30 minutes. At your sander, sand the trim sections flush with the face of the larger pieces. Reverse the piece direction from time to time to avoid over sanding one end. After sanding both faces of both pieces, turn off the sander and use the stationary belt to remove any glue squeeze out or overhang of the trim section along the edges of the material. To be clear, we are sanding the dark trim section pieces flush with the edges of the lighter piece, not the other way around. You do not want to change the width or remove the pencil line from the larger piece. Back at the table saw, place a mark on the trim section 3 seconds of an inch from the ends of the tails on the A-cut pieces. Continuing the mark to the edge of the stock can be helpful for lining up the crosscut later on using your miter gauge with a zero clearance subfence.
Now, simply align the pencil mark with the cut through your zero clearance subfence and cross cut the excess material from the trim sections. From this point forward, we'll be using standard half-blind technique to join the four rectangles of wood. The pieces just made will be cut as the tailboards. Slide your LS to the scoring pass position at zero and clamp the carriage in place. The full rabbit width for the IDDD pattern is 7 seconds of an inch. After making the scoring pass, make three subsequent passes of 1 16th inch to complete the rabbits. You'll find the rabbit width for your selected pattern listed under the diagram of the selection shown at the back of the master reference guide. After completing the rabbits, return the fence to the scoring pass position at zero. Clamp the right angle fixture to your fence and table, and place the two tailboards with the rabbits facing away from each other against the faceplate. Don't forget, pencil edges against the fence. Clamp the pieces securely with a wooden hand screw clamp. Turn the router on and make the scoring pass. Then advance to the first C cut in front of the zero through a series of light side by side cuts. After reaching the first C cut, 5C in this example, move your fence from one C cut to the next across the full width of your material. After completing the cuts, immobilize the right angle fixture and flip the stock. Again, pencil edges against the fence. Always press the pieces down and against the fence before securing to the right angle fixture. Return the LS to a scoring pass and repeat the tail series of cuts on your two boards. Keeping the pencil marked edges against the fence ensures that the A and C series of cuts remain synchronized even if you are slightly off center. For the pin cuts, move the LS to the first D cut that exposes the cutter outside the fence, 9D in this example. Bring the shop stop up to the outside diameter of the cutter and clamp in place. Again, this setup will always produce a socket that is a little short, so we'll only cut one end of one piece at this time, then adjust as necessary. 
Move the stock into the cut until you just touch the stop. Don't force the material against the stop surface. Now move from D cut to D cut until you've cut across the full width of your material. Assemble the pin board to one of the tail boards to determine how much you need to adjust the cut length. The amount that the tails protrude is equal to the amount the stop must be moved away from the cutter. Slide the scale to an easy reference number and move the stop away to adjust the cut length. Return the fence to the first D cut made and repeat this series of cuts on both ends of both boards. Assemble the pin boards to one of the tails, then add the remaining tail. The Incra double dovetail, truly a striking joint. For this demonstration, we've centered for two and a half inch wide material using the box G template with 8B as our center cut. Begin by moving the fence to a scoring pass position and lock the carriage in place. Slide the Lexan measuring scale to read zero under the cursor. Secure the right angle fixture to your table with a spring clamp and clamp two pieces of stock with a backing board to the faceplate. You can use your centering board as a backing piece. Securely tighten the hand screw clamp, then remove the spring clamp. Beginning with the scoring pass, advance to the first template mark in front of the zero in one or two passes. Once you've reached the first mark, 6A in this example, and made the cut, Simply move the LS positioner from one A cut to the next until you've cut across the full width of your stock. Keep in mind that your first cut will be based on the width of stock you've centered on. Unless you're using two and a half inch wide material as shown in this demo and 8B is your center cut, your first cut probably won't be the same as ours. After completing the cuts on one end of the two boards, Clamp the right angle fixture to your fence and table and flip the two boards over. As always, allow the cutter to come to a complete stop before unclamping the boards from the faceplate. Now we'll repeat the A series of cuts beginning with a scoring pass.
Next, we'll make the B series of cuts on the remaining two pieces of stock. Clamp the right angle fixture to your fence and table and flip the backing board over to present a fresh backing surface. Add the two pieces of stock and securely tighten the wooden hand screw clamp. Remove the spring clamp. Move the LS to the first B cut that positions the cutter outside the fence and make the cut. Now advance from one B cut to the next until you've cut across the full width of your material. As always, when using the right angle fixture, apply side pressure with your right hand to keep the right angle fixture against the face of the fence throughout the cut. Apply downward pressure with your left hand to keep the ends of your board firmly in contact with the table. After completing this series of cuts, flip your stock over on the right angle fixture one last time and repeat the B cut locations. Now assemble for a simple but effective joint that adds strength and beauty to your next project. Still looking for the signature joint that gives your project that custom look? The Variations Technique offers the perfect mechanism for custom design patterns using any equally spaced template. While every cut mark on a selected template that falls within your stock width must be made in order to produce a box joint or dovetail, you can change the order to create many interesting variations. The Variations Technique is really quite simple. By leaving cuts out when producing one side of a joint and then using the drop cuts on the other side, you can modify the look of an existing template. Let's take a look at a few examples. On this pin board, we skipped cuts 8B and 12B during the cutting process. This leaves wider pins between the sockets. To modify the tails to match, we simply make all of the required A cuts, plus we add in the two B cuts dropped when cutting the pins. On this tailboard, we skipped cuts 7A and 12A during the cutting process. This leaves wider tails. To modify the pins to match, simply make all of the usual B cuts required for the selected template, then remove the excess between the appropriate sockets. When cutting the pins, it's best to take out the excess material with several light side-by-side -side passes, rather than trying to remove the material in a single pass. You can even skip cuts on both sides of the joint to produce combinations of wide and narrow pins and tails. Just remember, whenever using the variations technique, you must always modify the joint pattern symmetrically. Give it a try sometime. Now that you've seen and learned about some of the many things that you can do with the LS positioner at your router table, it's time for you to start writing the next chapter in the Inkrajig story. All of the great projects you've been dreaming of are just a few well-placed cuts away, and now you've got just the right tool to make it happen. So put on that old shop apron, pick out a few nice boards, and let Inkra help make your next project a success. <laughs>